Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Michelle Morris, and I am from Consolidated Planning Group. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you all for joining us today, especially uh, Joy from Daymark Living. She's going to help help us out today. She has graciously, graciously um, decided to come on with us and tell you a little bit about Daymark before we get started. Uh, I do want to go over kind of the um, housekeeping items before we go any further. So we are in webinar, webinar mode here on Zoom, and that means that we can't hear the participants or see you, but I know you're out there. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything that you would like to let us know or ask us, please go ahead and put that in the chat box. And that way I can present as well as see the comments and questions that come through. And it makes it easier flow for me. So just like I said, any questions or comments, put them in the chat box. Um, we are recording this webinar. We record all of our webinars and we put them on our YouTube channel. So after we're finished today, you will receive a link to the webinar and you will also receive a copy of the slides that we're going to go over. Um, so that will be out there for you in your email later on today. And um, the other thing that I want to share with you is that we should be here for about an hour today. So like I said, we can't see you or hear you. You might as well relax, enjoy your lunch, have a beverage, whatever you want to do. Um, and I, I just hope that you get some information from this webinar that is going to be helpful for you. It's one of my favorites because it's a lot of information and it's quick. Um, if it feels too overwhelming for you, like I said, don't forget, you can ask questions, you can rewatch it later. You're gonna be able to look at the slides later on today, so no worries. So I am going to let Joy talk a little bit about Daymark Living. Look how beautiful. I love this, it's so gorgeous. I haven't been out to visit yet, Joy, so tell me about what it's like out at Daymark Living. Good morning or afternoon, everyone. <laughs> so I'm and some people it's still morning on on a, the West Coast. So welcome. That's true. That is true. <laughs> I'm so glad everyone is here. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, I am the director of sales and marketing at Daymark Living, and so I am the first point of contact, and I am probably um, one of the deepest points of contact in the process um, when people are considering Daymark. So as you can see in the picture, Daymark Living is a large campus for adults with special needs. We are we compare ourselves very often to a college campus. Adults are living independently together and making their own choices. But a lot of the misconception is, is that because we say they're living independently, that they're not getting assistance. So we have residents in all different levels of functioning. We have some residents who are nonverbal and extremely talented at music and art. And then we have residents with college degrees but can't live alone due to poor decision making or because they have seizures. Um, so there are all different levels of residents. We have about a third Down syndrome, a third autism, and a third other. So fragile X, rare genetic mutations, cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injuries. We have all different wonderful abilities on campus. And so as you can see, we have a series of cottages where the residents live. No one lives there with them. And so as, as we're having this conversation, this is why we cannot accept government services because we don't have um, someone living in the homes, each individual home with the residents. So we are a fully private pay campus. Um, our residents, there is staff on site 24-7, there's nursing care, there are people making sure everyone's okay, we have life coaches, we have domestic skills partners that are assisting them with hygiene care, or medication management, or um, tidying up their cottages. We are letting them make choices about what classes they're attending that can range from hobby to academic. So budgeting, money management, creative writing, expressive art, cultural exploration, international cooking, social media safety, circuit training, basketball 101. We're amazing in our special of basketball specifically. Um, we do bowling, bocce, and basketball. Um, basketball, we did, we, we did really well this year. We're pretty proud of our, our team. 
<laughs> so, so looking at these little cottages, is this, these are clearly not just one person. Is it four in each of these little buildings or just two? So it's two, three, or four residents in each cottage. They have their own bedroom and their own restroom, which we feel is very important for our population. And then they share a living space and a full kitchen. Fantastic. And then you can see um, some of our common areas. Oh, it's okay. In the middle, you can see our resort style pool. You can see our multi sports court. Um, you can see our fitness center that has a theater and a workout gym and a game room. Um, in the middle there, you have the classroom building. And on the far side, you have our um, clubhouse, which features our dining hall and our administrative offices. Oh, fantastic. And these are some of your residents having a great time. Yes. Yeah, so, so these are our residents. Again, you can see um, that we have different diagnoses on campus. Um, these are our lovely ladies. Um, we do different activities and outings around um, the community. We do intermingle with the typical population. Um, we do differ from other um, campuses in that our residents are allowed to date. Um, most of them, it's just a relationship roulette and they're just cute. Um, but some of them are serious about dating and they must take um, dating class, a boundaries class, and they must do um, a dating contract where they're doing what they're supposed to do in order to be able to date seriously. Oh, that's fantastic. So if you would like to um, tour Daymark, I will let you know. So our rate, I always like to let everybody know and be very transparent because if you come to Daymark and then I tell you the rate and you're just, it's just not something that you're able to do. I hate for you to fall in love and then um, it's it's not something that was within your means. So um, at Daymark's rate is 4,900 a month. It's pretty standard with the large campuses um, across the country. We're all kind of around the same range. And this presentation is going to be so helpful and understanding how people are able to afford something like Daymark. Yes, thank you so much. So if you have questions about Daymark or if you want to go set up a tour, Joy's information is here for you. Um, and Joy, you can put that in the chat box as well, but you will receive these slides later and you'll be able to have her contact info there for you. So I really appreciate you taking a minute just to welcome everybody to today's webinar. We are talking about um, a lot of things you need to know today about planning for the future of your loved one. Um, and first of all, I always like to start it off with a little bit about who we are at Consolidated Planning Group, um, why you should be listening to us, why we do the, these webinars in the first place. Well, we are first and foremost financial advisors. We take a holistic approach to helping families plan for the future, whether that be through life insurance, um, investments, securities, tax planning, estate planning, um, all of those different areas of your financial future. We kind of want to shake out that information and organize it all and set it all out so that you can see exactly what you have in place and exactly what you need and where there might be some gaps in what you have versus what you need to be thinking about for the future. Not only that, we've been doing that for over 30 years as a company, but we focus on helping families. It's, it's our specialty really to help families who have a loved one with some sort of intellectual or developmental disability that might prevent them from being able to be completely independent in their lives. Maybe they can't hold a job. Maybe they need care. Maybe they need residential communities like Daymark Living. Um, and how on earth could you afford that? What does that look like? When she says it's, it's 4,900 a month, um, to live there, people panic. And that's that's reasonable because that's a lot of money. So we help families determine what that's going to look like for them and if that's a possibility. Um, we are members of the Special Needs Planning Academy and we're nationally certified as social security advisors. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for over 30 years. We are located just outside of Houston, Texas in the Sugarland area, but we serve families all across Texas and all across the United States. So some of today's information might be 
related to Texas, and some of it might be national programs. Um, but either way, rest assured, we can help you um, with planning for the future. And, and you're thinking, okay, what do you mean special needs planning? What is that? Well, families come to us and we really help them get things lined up uh, for protection plans for their whole family. What happens if the main breadwinner in your house becomes ill or disabled themselves and can't work? There are plans available through life insurance, disability protection, income protection, things like that, uh, long-term care, uh, short-term care disability protection, that we can set up those things for you so that if something happens to you, you know that your family will still be taken care of. We can help with planning for your child's lifetime care needs. Transition planning, you know, a lot happens when they transfer from being a minor to an adult when they turn 18 or transitioning from high school out into the real world. What does that look like? We can help with all of those things. Um, we discuss ABLE accounts, special needs trusts, legal needs, um, SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, Medicare, how to apply for all those things, that future cost of care when you're thinking about, you know, when I'm not here anymore, what amount of money does my loved one need to be taken care of for the rest of their life? And what, how do we do that? We help you with all of those things. And mostly we're here to educate you and to advocate for you because we know that this is very nuanced and it's difficult. And um, there's a lot of noise out there and misinformation. We want to help make sure that you're getting the correct information. So when you are here at webinars that are hosted by Consolidated Planning Group, you are in the right place. We are members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We have, um, as of next month, I think the first day of September, I'm going <clears> to <throat> hopefully get the paperwork. I've already passed all the exams to become a chartered special needs consultant through the College of Financial Planning. Um, so we have a chartered financial needs consultant on staff. Um, we have certified social security advisors on staff. We have MBAs on staff. Um, but you know, out of all of the financial advisors across the United States, there's over 263,000 of them. But all of these firms that are working for you, there are only about 200 across the entire United States that focus truly on special needs planning like we do. And, um, you know, we are experts in this area. It's really important to have somebody who understands the nuances of special needs planning so that you don't um, make mistakes that are going to jeopardize your children's benefits. So getting started, uh, we think it's really important to develop a letter of intent for your family. Work with professionals in special needs planning and work with attorneys who understand these things. Because again, you could spend more money trying to fix mistakes than you would have spent in the first place by hiring the right people. Um, use an estate planning attorney who understands special needs planning, somebody who can help you with your will, of course, but also a special needs trust and guardianship if that is something that you need in your future. At least helping with um, power of attorney, things like that would be helpful. We want you to gather all of the things, all of the planning documents, and we're thinking about what do you already have in place for your family and your children as it relates to their legal needs, your life insurance, your investments, your savings, and why do we need the parents' investment and savings information when we're talking about the child? Because we want to make sure that you're getting the most out of those things that you've signed up for, the life insurance you've purchased, the investments that you have are performing well, so that you have money for your children. Um, and then we want to think about your vision of what the future looks like for yourself and for your loved ones. What are their capabilities? What are their strengths? And where do you see them going in the future? And how can we help make those things come true? 
Uh, so the first thing I mentioned was the letter of intent. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is. Um, a letter of intent, this is an important way that you can share your hopes and dreams and wishes for your loved one with whoever might need to step in and take care of them in the future. Um, so let's imagine that all of a sudden you aren't there tomorrow and somebody needs to step in. Maybe it's an aunt or uncle or um, a sibling or a, a close friend or another relative or something that is going to step in and be the guardian of your child from now on. This letter of intent is intended to give them an overview, an easy place to look and learn about your loved one. Quick facts, you know, start with family information, medical history, who their doctors are, what benefits they're already receiving. You know, think about what you know about them factually first. And this is coming from a, a woman who used to be an English teacher before I got into uh, finance and, and helping families. Um, I would, if I were you, I would start this on my laptop or, or my computer and start with the facts because those are easy to get out there. And then as you start thinking about the facts, then the fun stuff is going to start coming out. And you're going to be thinking about, okay, this is her educational history, but then you can add in what she really enjoys about school and what is a struggle. Um, you know, every morning you have to help her pick out her outfit. She can dress herself, but she doesn't understand weather maybe. Or every afternoon, you know, he, as soon as he gets home, he's going to need a snack and he's going to want this and that. What are their personality? What's the habits that they are, um, you know, really stuck on that somebody needs to know about? What spiritual beliefs do they hold or do you want them to hold? What values, what traditions do you have in your family? All of these things are what is going to go into your letter of intent. Now, it's not a legally binding document. You don't have to have an attorney sign it. You don't have to show it to the courts. It's just an informational guide for somebody who might need to step in and take care of your loved one. Uh, but you want to have information in there about their legal needs, banking information. Um, do they have an ABLE account? Do they have a special needs trust? Who are the contacts? Who is your circle of trust and your support system that is helping? Um, and, and really, you know, having a person step in, they, they're going to need to know a lot about your family. So it might be overwhelming. But like I said, start this on your laptop. Print whatever your latest version is so that it's not, you know, hidden behind a password and a firewall and protection on your laptop, because this is important information that somebody is going to need to actually be able to get. Um, and then as your family grows and evolves, maybe in a couple months, you'll revisit this le letter of intent and change a few things, update it, um, fill out more information that you didn't think of before. Let your family and your loved one help you fill this out. Of course, they they want to have a say. Um, so fill out all of this information and then print the latest version and stick it in your binder or in that folder on your desk or whatever situation you have in your household. And then get back to it later and just keep doing that process. Keep updating as your family changes and you're going to be just fine. Like I said, you don't have to have it approved by an attorney or anything like that. The next thing that people, um, you know, when you're thinking about planning for the future, um, the money part, it's, it's very troublesome. And when we do plans for families and we're telling them how much money it's going to need, uh, their child is going to need to be taken care of, um, it's really important to think about their state and federally fund, funded programs like SSI, SSDI, Medicaid, Medicare. It's so important that you get those programs and the waivers. Goodness, they, those are such great programs and they're so valuable. They are going to help you 
be able to fund your child's future. So you want to make sure that you understand the criteria and that you do not jeopardize your children's benefits. That's why it's so important to have things like your special needs trust set up. Um, make sure that your life insurance and your current assets, anything that you want to leave to your child goes to their special needs trust and not to them directly. If you have them named as a beneficiary, you're going to jeopardize those benefits. Also, make sure they have an ABLE account established before you pass away. These are all places where they can have money, but it won't jeopardize those benefits because it's so important. Now, when your child turns 18, you can apply for SSI for them. Typically, before they turn 18, your child is not going to qualify for SSI because they consider the parent's income as, and assets as being available to the child to use. Um, so if you, as a parent, make over $1,550 per month, or if you have more than two or three or 4,000 um, in assets, like in your bank account or an IRA or 403B or 401K, um, any of your retirement accounts, things like that. If you have more than one house, more than one car, you're not going to qualify. But when your child turns 18, if they cannot work earning more than that substantial gainful amount, that's that 1550 a month, um, if they don't have more than $2,000 in their bank account, if they don't own more than one house or one car, they will be able to qualify for SSI benefits. So they won't quali qualify until they turn 18. So don't bother applying for anything until they are, are 18. You're just going to be shooting yourself in the foot. Um, if you need to or want to go in to your local social security office to apply, you should call several months in advance to get an appointment set to go in. Now, this is in situations where, you know, maybe you don't want to mess with an online application, which is fine. You can go in and you can do it. Um, maybe your benefits, your social security is already turned on. You're already receiving some kind of disability or something from social security, they would need you to go in in person to apply for your child's SSI benefits. Um, so if you need to go in, call them a few months in advance and set up an appointment. If you don't have to go in, it's much easier uh, to apply for SSI online. Start this the day of or after their 18th birthday. Even if it takes you a little while, a, a week or two to get the application filled out, and it takes them several months to get to it, uh, they will still backdate your application to the day that you started it online. So you will get back pay for that. Um, you're going to want to have evidence, well, you're going to need to have evidence that your child has a disability. You can check out the social security blue book. I think we have a link coming up and if not, you can Google it. The social security blue book will tell you um, what they're looking for in terms of a diagnosis and um, how they qualify to be considered disabled under the eyes of social security. So if your child has autism and ADHD and hearing loss, you know, you can look up each of those diagnoses and see what it says in the blue book. Um, it has to be a disability that began before your children turned age 22 in order for them to qualify for childhood disability benefits later. Uh, but for right now, you know, you just want them to get signed up for SSI. They're going to ask for your child's uh, physicians and that includes the contact information. So name, address, phone number, um, your child's diagnosis history. I mean, you don't have to have printouts and everything, but you need to know like in 2017, they were diagnosed with this. In 2014, they were diagnosed with this, whatever. These are their doctors. These are the medications they're on. Um, if your child is working, they will want to see pay stubs. And they're also going to want to see the last three months of bank statements. And this is to ensure that 
your child is not making too much money to qualify or does not have too much in assets to qualify. And you might even, if you're a little extra like we are, you might want to contact your child's primary care physician and ask to see those medical records and see what's in there to make sure that it is documented well that your child has these disabilities and everything is in there that they're going to want to see. So when you apply, uh, we want you to know what to expect. First of all, it's going to take some time for them to get back to you. They're behind their government office. It is just what it is. And, and getting a full decision typically takes up to a year, um, sometimes even longer. So that's why it's so important if you start your application on the day of or right after their birthday, even if it takes them a year to get everything figured out, they'll back pay you. So that's that's a really nice thing that, that they do. You do want to make sure that you spend that money or move it out of their bank account in a timely manner. We'll help you with that. Don't panic if you first get a letter saying that you're denied. Um, I'm sorry for my typos there. I put that in early this morning. You're a denied SSDI. Oh my gosh, my apologies. What I'm trying to say is, when you fill out your application for SSI, behind the scenes, they're also filling out an application for you for or for your child for SSDI. And if you as a parent are receiving your Social Security benefit, your child might qualify for SSDI. But if you have not turned on your Social Security benefits yet, which is actually good, that's actually the right way to do it. Um, you're going to get a letter saying that you have been denied for SSDI. That's fine. And sometimes we get that panicked phone call. They denied me for SSI. No, they didn't. They denied you for SSDI. Relax. Once your local social security office has your SSI file all put together, they're going to send it to Austin to the Disability Determination Services office. And they are going to order medical records and look through your file and make sure that you qualify before they approve your um, SSI benefits. You can call them. So what I would suggest is, you know, after you talk with your local office and you get your application all filled out and you've done everything online, maybe you've had a phone interview, maybe they're going to ask you to come into the office. After you're done with that part of it, they send your application to Austin to DDS. You can call DDS and you can say, hey, have you received our file? It's been a month now, maybe since we talked to the local office. Do you have our file yet? Um, if not, you know, okay, we'll call back in a few more weeks. Or maybe you want to find out who has your file, who has it been assigned to? Do they have all of the medical records and everything they need? Is the file complete? Um, do they have any additional questions? Do you need to reach out to your doctor to get the ball rolling? Um, they actually answer their phones there and they're good at, at helping out. When you apply later on for your own social security retirement benefits or disability benefits, there's a different benefit that your child will get. That's the SSDI that I was just talking about. So in the best scenario, what's going to happen is your child will turn 18. You apply for them to get SSI. When they get SSI, they also get Medicaid. So they're going to have SSI and Medicaid when they're about 18 and a half to 19 years old, if you apply right away. They're going to be living on that. They're going to be getting that for hopefully many years. And then in your future, when you as a parent are in your late 60s, you're going to start your Social Security benefits where you're getting your Social Security retirement benefits. At that point, your child will turn off their SSI and they're going to turn on SSDI, which is under your record. It's sometimes called uh, DAC, Disabled Adult Child Benefits, or lately they they switched it to calling it CDB, Childhood Disability Benefits. Um, so that they're, they're going to get off of SSI and on to SSDI. After they've been on SSDI 
uh, for two years, 24 months, then they will start receiving Medicare. This is 24 months after they turn 18, um, after hopefully they've been receiving SSI, they've got Medicaid, now they're going to get Medicare as well, and they'll be dual eligible. They'll be able to get both. Um, later on, once your child has been on SSDI and Medicare, hopefully for many years, you're still going to be around. But once you pass away, they're going to go from receiving an amount that is equal to half of your benefit to 75% of your benefit. So let's say you're receiving $4,000 for your Social Security retirement. You're going to be getting your $4,000 and your child will be getting $2,000 up until the point when you pass away. And then your child's amount is going to go up to $3,000 and they'll get that for the rest of their lives. And so that's why it's so important to make sure you maximize your Social Security benefits so that your child can get that amount um, for the rest of their life. Now, there are family maximums. If you have yourself receiving your benefit and a spouse drawing from your record, maybe they haven't turned on their own record yet, your, your spouse, uh, but they're taking care of your child at home. There's a, there's a child in care benefit that your spouse can get. And then maybe you have your child drawing from your record. Maybe you have two children with disabilities. It's possible to hit a family maximum. Um, once your spouse goes on to their own benefits, um, those family maximums won't be hit anymore. Or, you know, we, we can help you determine what the best way to maximize those is. So again, you really want to make sure that you protect your child's benefits by making sure that they have their money in the right buckets. Um, make sure that they have an ABLE account. They have a special needs trust for the money to go to so that the Social Security Administration doesn't count that against them. Make sure that you never leave money straight to your child as a beneficiary because, you know, if you pass away and the money goes straight to little Jacob, all of a sudden, Jacob has way more money than he's supposed to, and his benefits will be lost. Now, if you had signed up Jacob's special needs trust as a beneficiary instead of Jacob outright, everything would be fine. Um, so just make sure that you're not leaving money directly to your child, whether that be your life insurance, investments, your bank account, any assets that you have. Make those assets um, first go Typically, you know, your assets go to your spouse first. And then if your spouse is no longer here, they go uh, to your children. And people say, oh, yes, just divide it equally between my children, Johnny and Mary and Jacob. Oh, if they forget to say, not Jacob, but special needs trust for the benefit of Jacob, it could cause trouble. Also make sure that if you have grandma and grandpa who might want to leave Jacob money or aunts or uncles or friends, they know this rule too. It cannot be left straight to him. It must go to a third party special needs trust. Now, an attorney can help you get a third party special needs set trust set up. We don't have an attorney on staff, but we do refer clients to trusted attorneys who focus on special needs planning in their area, okay? Um, and that's that's really important for the special needs trust and also for guardianship. Guardianship can start, you can start that process when you are within about six months of your child's 18th birthday. Now, guardianship is, it's a court process. You have to go before a judge. You have to have an attorney for yourself and an ad, ad litem attorney for your child. Um, and you want to work with a qualified attorney to make sure that the, the special needs trust and the guardianship is set up correctly. They can also help you with your will and things like that. I don't see any questions in the chat box yet, so I'm gonna keep plowing along. Hopefully I'm explaining things in a way that is making sense for you. If you pick up just one or two little tidbits today, that's, that's what I'm hoping for, is that you can take some actionable items with you. So let's switch focus a little bit. We're going to talk about a different facet here. Let's get into ABLE accounts. 
So I mentioned that an AMO account is one place where you can have money saved for your loved one where it will not count against them for SSI or Medicaid, any of those um, programs, it won't disqualify them. So when you have an ABLE account, this is a 529 account. It's a 529A. You might have heard of a 529C, that's for college. 529 college savings account, you put money in to save for college. The 529A is the ABLE account. And this is where, this is for any individual who has a disability that began before they turned 26 years old. The age is a little bit different on this program. So as long as you sign them up for an ABLE account, you can, you can put money in this account. The beneficiary is the account owner, but anyone can put money in. What happens is you put money into the account. They take out a maintenance fee usually right from the beginning. And then the rest of the money you deposit gets used to buy mutual funds or electronic traded funds. And then they grow in value. The growth that your account earns is not taxed. So that's another huge benefit. The first huge benefit is that it doesn't count against them. And you can have kind of a savings account for your child that SSI and Medicaid won't look at. Um, the other huge benefit is the fact that it grows and the income is not taxed. Unfortunately, you cannot deduct the contributions on your taxes, um, your federal taxes. They don't allow for a deduction for that. And some states do, but Texas is a no income tax state. So of course it doesn't apply in Texas, but it might apply in other places. Um, now, how to get an ABLE account? I see this question in the chat box. There are over 50 different ABLE accounts across the United States. There are certain rules that are set for all of them. And then there's other things that differ in each of these different programs. So there's a Texas ABLE account. There's a Virginia ABLE account. There's every different state has one. Now, typically, you don't have to be a resident of that state to use their ABLE account. And you don't have to use the ABLE account for the state that you live in. So we typically sign our clients up for the one that is through Virginia. It's from American Funds. That's a company that we know and trust and we work with a lot for our clients. Um, if you are interested, we can do all the paperwork for you and get you set up for an ABLE account if you want to use the one that we use. And we would go through all the terms and conditions and um, illustrations and all of that stuff with you. If you're interested in doing it on your own, you certainly can. You can compare different ABLE accounts online, find which one is a good fit for you and sign yourself up and do all of that. That's It's either way, whatever you prefer. All banks and credit unions do not have ABLE accounts. All ABLE accounts are not created equal. Some companies are better at it than others. Some you have to call and get transferred 50 times before they figure out that one person who sits in the dark office who knows something about the ABLE accounts. And some of them do them very, very well. And that's why we choose uh, the one for our client that we do, clients that we do. The cool thing about ABLE accounts is um, it stands for achieving a better life experience or living experience. And so from your ABLE account, you can purchase anything for your child that helps them achieve a better life experience. It can be financial management services like consolidated planning group. It could be legal things like helping to pay for uh the special needs trust getting set up. It can be transportation, um, assistive devices, clothing, ho housing, utilities, food, computer, car, vacation, pretty much anything. You can use an ABLE account to pay for it and it won't disrupt any other benefits. Now, with the ABLE account, there are contribution limits. And the reason for that, you know, the government doesn't want you to put a million dollars in there and grow it through mutual funds and not have to pay taxes on 
all of that income, but they'll give you a little bit, right? So they'll, you can put $18,000 into the ABLE account for 2024. Next year, it's going to be a little bit more. Each year, it changes a little bit. 18,000 for 2024. You can put in even more of th than that if your um, loved one is working, but you never, ever, ever want your ABLE account to go above $100,000. Okay, if the ABLE account goes above $100,000 in there at one time, you'll, you're going to lose out on SSI. And it doesn't mean like you can't over the lifetime have $100,000 flow in and out of this account. This account is made for money to flow in and out. You're not going to put it in there and let it sit for 30 or 40 years like a retirement account. This is a save to spend. I hope that's making sense. You want to put money in there, let it build up a little bit, use it for monthly things that you need. It would be tied to a bank account so you can transfer easily back and forth, okay? It's important to remember that an individual who uses the ABLE account has to have a disability. So if you want to roll it over to a different child of yours, um, that's fine, but that person has to also have a disability and meet the criteria. If you currently have a 529 college savings account, it's easy to put it into an ABLE account instead. And then that way your child can use it even if they don't decide to go to college. They can open up the opportunity for what they can use it for. Another thing you need to know about ABLE accounts is that um, when your child passes away, if there is money left over in the ABLE account at that time, Medicaid can come back and claim reimbursement through the ABLE account. So again, if there's money left over, Medicaid can come reclaim some of that money to help pay for costs associated with taking care of your child. Now, uh, I'm going to finish up. I'm going to talk a little bit more about a special needs trust and the difference between the trust and the ABLE account, and then I'm going to get to the questions in the chat box. So let me get through like two more slides and then we'll get to questions. So I, I mentioned that the ABLE account, you can pay for housing, food, shelter, clothing, cash, utilities, anything, but there's a limit on how much money you can put in, right? So the special needs trust kind of flips those rules around. You can put any amount of money into the special needs trust that you want. It could be millions and millions and millions of dollars, and we want it to be. But all of these things the special needs trust can pay for, if you use the special needs trust to pay for these things, rent, mortgage payments, real estate taxes, utilities like gas and electric and water, if you use the special needs trust to take out cash or to buy food, or to pay for homeowner's insurance that your lender requires on the mortgage. If you use the special needs trust for these items, your amount of SSI will be reduced. So, so that's how it's kind of structured and why it's so good to have both the ABLE account and the special needs trust so they can each do their parts. You can move money from the special needs trust into the ABLE account to pay for these things but never pay straight from the special needs trust for these items unless your child does not need SSI. So again, this goes back to the beginning of the talk. If your child has already switched from SSI to SSDI, then you can use the special needs trust to pay for these things and it won't matter anymore, okay? So just keep that in mind. So let me pause here for a little bit on my slides and answer some questions. And then we'll go back to slides and then back to questions. So back to talking about SSI. I said that when you are still alive and you have turned on your social security retirement benefits, your child will switch from SSI to SSDI. They're gonna get half while you're alive of your SS social security amount and then when you pass away, they're going to get 75% of your amount. So this question says the 75% of SSDI when the parent passes away, is that based on the full retirement age? Yes, 
So if you take your social security retirement benefit at age 65, you might not receive your full retirement age benefit, but your child's benefit will be based on your full retirement age. And so that is exactly why sometimes we tell our clients to turn on your social security even before age 67. Maybe one parent turns it on at 65 or 66 and the other parent waits until 68 or 70. Uh, we have a tool that will tell us exactly when you should turn on those benefits so that your whole family gets the maximum amount allowable. Uh, and I hope that answers your question. Uh, this person wants to know, after applying for SSI, but before it is approved, if you move to a different state, ooh, you're gonna move while you're in the application process. Does that application get transferred to the new state's processing center or do you have to start over? In a perfect world, it would get transferred, but I don't think, I don't think they've got you're back on that one. I think you're probably going to have to start over in your new state, okay, when you're thinking about that SSI application. Now, the rules and everything should be pretty much the same, but that processing center is different, and I don't know that they, they're talking to each other. So, yeah, contact your new state, your new local office, and see what they say. Does the ABLE account get audited? Uh, because first-party trusts do get audited every year. Um, the ABLE account, as far as we know, that's me knocking on wood, they don't really audit those. What they do is um, you sign that says this is an, aff an affidavit that I know what I need to use this account for and that I'm going to follow the rules and that my, my loved one does have a disability. And as far as we have seen, none of our clients have been audited yet. We would not like for you to be the first one, but if you are, you know, it's important to keep receipts. You don't have to track every single item and what it was used for, but just make sure that the ABLE account is being used for your child for things that they need. And, and do, you know, keep transaction records, your bank account information, tr transactions is probably fine. We say, have a bank account for your child that is only their money, even if your name is also on it. Just have that one account be only their money. And that way, as money flows in and out from and to the ABLE account, you know that that's theirs because it's all only their money. Make sense? Um, and then finally, can they only have a trust? You can have both. And we want people to have both, the special needs trust and the ABLE account. Okay, I think I already probably answered that after you typed it, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, so the last question, I'm going to get back to more slides and then I'll go back to more questions, but um, follow up, following up on that. My son has a checking account right now. Should he also have an ABLE account? Yes. Your ABLE account will be linked to your checking account so that anytime you want to move uh, money from the ABLE to the checking account to be able to pay for something, it's very easy. You can go online and do it. Or you can contact us if we set it up for you and we can take care of that transfer. Um, if your son's bank account is starting to get near that $2,000 limit because your child cannot have more than $2,000 in their bank account. So if it's getting close to that $2,000 limit, then you just transfer money from the bank account to the ABLE account. That's, that's the way it works. And that's why it's such a good thing to have. All right. Uh, go ahead and put more questions in the chat box if you have them, and I will get to them, but I'm going to do more slides first. We have about 10 minutes left. So we always say and we always advise that the time to start planning for your child's future or for your loved one's future is right now. It doesn't matter if they're an infant or a middle schooler or a young adult uh, or 30 or 40 years old. You need to start planning right now. Developing a care plan now and thinking about the future is going to help you sleep better at night. It's going to help you have a bigger impact by making smaller changes that are easier to make rather than, oh my gosh, I 
we haven't done anything and now it's time and we don't have anything in place. Well, it's it's better to do it now and not go through that panic mode. Um, if you're already in that, that's okay. We can help you. We can, like I said, clear out the noise and the clutter and help you focus on what's really most important to do right this second. Um, but if you have more time, it's it's easier on you that way. We want you to think about what's going to happen after high school. You probably don't want your child to graduate to the couch and they probably don't want to do that. So what are some um, vocational options after high school? There are great educational options after high school. And we do entire webinars on those things, educational, vocational, and residential. I mean, look at Daymark Living. It's a fabulous example, probably one of the premier examples of residential communities for your loved ones with special needs. And that's why we're talking about them today, because we want you to think ahead about that. And once you've found the perfect spot for your loved one and you've toured the facility and you've checked everything out, we want you to make sure that you're doing this early because there could be a wait list. Um, if there's a wait list for your loved one, get on that wait list early and then you have the first right of turning it down if you're not ready or you know pushing back a little bit. Do make careful consideration before you just assume that a sibling is going to be the one to take care of your uh, loved one. I always use Jacob because that's my son's name and it's easy for me to just uh, use Jacob's name. So let's say your your loved one Jacob with has has Down syndrome and you just always kind of thought, well, his older sister, Sarah, she's going to take care of him when they're older. She's She's got a job. She's going to college. She'll be fine. It'll be fine. Well, you know, maybe later on in life, Sarah's just not feeling it. Um, maybe she's got her own kids. Maybe her kids have disabilities. She's got her own job, her own life, her own things going on. Um, and maybe she might see this as kind of an obligation that you've given to her. You don't want them to have an obligatory relationship. Maybe, you know, all the, all of these years, it could go the other way around too. You know, Jacob, has seen Sarah as his sister and they have fun together and they're siblings. And now all of a sudden, Sarah wants to try to step in and act like mom. That's not going to happen. She's not my mom. She's my sister. So there can be some resentment that way too. So just be really careful um, before you name a sibling as a future caregiver. Okay. Uh, the Texas Medicaid waivers. Now, each state has their own waiver programs. Some states do not have a waiting list. They just give you services pretty much as soon as you sign up. In Texas, the waiting list for some of these wa waivers can be up to 20 years long. Get on the waiting list in Texas ASAP. Um, for MDCP class and DBMD, you're going to call this 877 phone number. Whoops. Now, some of there's MDCP class DBMD. Two of those programs are very specialized. MDCP is only for people who are medically dependent or children who are medically dependent. And DBMD is only for people who are deaf, blind, and have another disability. So many people don't qualify for those. However, almost everybody qualifies for class if there's an intellectual or developmental disability. So everybody on this phone call needs to call that 877 number and get your child on their waiting list. Then for um, home and community services, Texas Home Living, community first choice, those waivers you apply for by getting in touch with your LIDA or your local intellectual and developmental disability authority, LIDA. Um, those are places like the Harris Center, Texana, Blue Bonnet, MHMR, ACOG. Um, different counties, different areas have different local authorities. So that link at the very bottom of the page when you receive these slides later on today, you're going to click that link and find your local authority. Call them and make sure that your child is on their waiting list. 
Uh, and then finally, STAR Plus is for age 21 and up. So if your uh, child was on MDCP, and they're getting to the age of 21, they can switch over to STAR Plus. Now, I have not added it to this slide yet. I see that I need to, but you can also go to your texasbenefits.com. Let me put that in the chat box, yourtexasbenefits.com. And you can check your place in line for these Medicaid waivers. If you move out of Texas, you apply in your new state. If you move to a different county, you have to let your old local authority know that you're not in their service area anymore. And you need to let the new local authority know that you're there and you're under their umbrella now. You will not lose your place in line for the Texas programs. This is a list, and I'm not going to go through it, but you can look through it later, of the different, some of the different waiver programs um, here in Texas that you can apply for. Yes, okay. So this is a list you can read later, and I'm going to put this up and then get to a couple more questions. I only have like two more slides, and then we'll wrap up, okay? So these are some of the webinars we do read through that as we get some of these questions answered. Can you fund the ABLE account from the first party trust? Yes. Your first party trust is for money that belongs to your child. This is money that maybe they've pay, been paid a settlement from an accident, you know, maybe whatever caused their disability. Um, that would go into a first party special needs trust. If you're getting child support for your child after they turn age 18, that will have to go into the first party special needs trust. Uh, things like that. That's where if, if grandma accidentally leaves money straight out to Jacob, we would go ahead and get that put into his first party special needs trust. There is also that Medicaid uh, reimbursement rule on the first party trust, not the third party. Okay, so we do recommend that you spend money from the ABLE and the first party trust first and leave the third party trust money for uh, later in life. If one of the parents is already retired and already getting their social security benefits, will the child still be able to receive SSI and Medicaid? That's what you want to do. Even if your child is a minor and you're already receiving social security retirement or disability benefits, and you will probably have to go to your local office when you're applying for SSI in this case. But what we want you to do is get your child on SSI first, even if it's a lower amount of money, because that way they will get Medicaid. Once the SSI comes through and they are on Medicaid, then you can switch them over to SSDI under your record, which is probably going to be a larger amount of money. And then after they're on that for two years, they will also be eligible for Medicare and they'll still have Medicaid. So that way they'll be covered by Medicaid while they're waiting for Medicare. Um, are there different special needs, supplemental special needs trusts? Yes, we talked about the two of them. Move on. If Do we wait until our kids turn 18 to get on the Medicaid lists? No, you do not have to wait until they're 18 to get on these wet Medicaid waiver wait lists. Do that as soon as possible. As soon as they're born, if there is any indication that there might be a disability, I would say any Texas parent needs to put their child on this list because it is so, so long. You wanna get those benefits as soon as you possibly can. Get on the waiver list as soon as possible. Absolutely, don't wait. Um, okay, so I've left this up long enough. You've probably seen this if you've been to any of our waivers before, uh, any of our webinars before. This slide, when you receive it later today, will take you straight to all of our upcoming webinars so you can register for them. Once you register for the webinar, you'll get a reminder of, about it, of course, but you're also going to receive a um, link to the slot to the webinar and you're going to receive the slides 
once that webinar has been done. So it'll keep you in the loop even if you cannot attend in person. This is our team. The uh, financial advisors are on the top row. Allison and Jeff are a married couple with two special needs loved ones. Um, Andy and I are a married couple with two, um, two adult teenage, well, young adults, <laughs> children. Um, and then we have a fantastic operations staff who really keep everything running smoothly and uh, do all the calls and scheduling and marketing and all of that, all of our paperwork. So they really keep the office going. We are, sorry, but we are going to reach out to you to see if you want to schedule your free consultation. Please don't hang up. Don't be mean. We're just doing our jobs. We want to see if you have any further questions after today's webinar and if you want to schedule your free, free Zoom meeting. It's typically 30 to 45 minutes. Our first goal in that meeting is to answer your questions. So whatever you lingering questions you might have, we're going to answer those for you. And then we'll talk a little bit about your family and what's going on in your life and what We've, we're going to ask for a questionnaire to be filled out ahead of time, and then we'll tell you about us and how we work, what our fees look like, and that kind of stuff. And then you can decide from there, and we can decide if it's a good idea for us to work together. Um, I promise we don't bite. We are truly there to help and then to tell you about our services. Uh, you can use the QR code to schedule, or you can call or email, or you can wait for us to reach out to you. Um, you can also follow us on our YouTube channel. That's our Instagram. We have a podcast, and you can also follow us on Facebook. Okay, so now that I've gotten through all that information, I know we're past one o'clock, but I do want to get these last couple of questions um, it looks like there's just one last question. Is there an income limit that if everyone exceeded, the child is not eligible for their parents' social security? If your child is working, they won't be eligible to get your benefits um, if they go over the substantial gainful amount, but it's not based on the parents' income. Um, no, your par the parent cannot make too much income that the child would not qualify, but the child can make too much income. So when you have your free consult with us, we can go over that in detail with you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here with me and for staying beyond the hour. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate Joy from um, Daymark for helping spread the word about today's webinar. I hope you all have a great week, and I hope that I get to hear from you soon with any questions that you might have. All right, everybody go, go do great and have a fantastic week. Bye.